Hi, it's Zoe Routh, and I'm thrilled to bring you Carrie Leeson, the CEO of Lifeline, today on the podcast. You're going to learn heaps from her about compassion and leadership and business. So let's get into it. Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, your source of strategies and insights to make you a better leader. Influence, improve, inspire. Hi, this is Zoe Rath, and I'm here today with the amazing Carrie Leeson, who is the CEO of Lifeline Canberra. And I've known uh, Carrie for the last couple of years. We met at a men's link breakfast, of all things, and hit it off, and I've done some work with Lifeline since. And I'm extremely excited to have her as a table host at the upcoming Unconference Edge of Leadership in March in Canberra, and because she has a lot to share about compassion as well as business and the great function that Lifeline provides in the community. So a little bit of background about Carrie. Uh, she, uh, before she was CEO of Lifeline, she was previously a board member of the organization, so a strong commitment to Lifeline itself. She was executive director at Happia, which is the Health and Productivity Institute, was the chair of the advisory council at um, Workplace Health Association, and was on the advisory council for Aspen Medical. And she was a finalist for the Telstra Business Woman of the Year in 2010. So, um, and you started off as a fitness instructor. I saw that on your LinkedIn profile. <laughs> <laughs> so health has obviously been a huge part of your background. Mm-hmm. Um, so tell us, tell me first of all, how, fitness instructing. Did you actually get up in front of classes and teach fitness classes? <laughs> yes, I did. I did. I'm not particularly coordinated but it was something that I'd set my mind I think it was a new year's resolution to challenge myself and it was something I could fit in and around my degree and my studies at that time of my life it fitted in really well obviously had a passion for health and uh, that's reflected through my career with my my business which I owned and sold um, and throughout the roles you've just described I think uh, healthy body healthy mind I don't know which one comes first and um, I think if you focus on those, look after yourself, um, you, you're in good stead for what life has to throw at us. Mm. I agree with that. I think healthy, which one comes first, healthy body, healthy mind, I think they're so interrelated. Yeah. And you need. I think it helps if you get some exercise. It tends to generate some endorphins and then you can get, your, get yourself reset. Um, I should also ask you, what's your funny accent? Because people will be listening, going, where do you, you know, there's a Canadian in Australia, I have got my own funny accent. What's, where's your accent from? I'm from South Africa, so I moved to Australia 15 years ago. I am English-speaking South African, so I don't have the strong Afrikaans twang, so it makes it hard to decipher where I'm from. Yeah. Uh, well, you do, yeah, I guess it is a, not quite a twang, yeah. So what? how did you end up moving to Australia from South Africa? I moved here for work on a two-year visa, and I moved straight to Canberra. I'm from a big city, Durban, in South Africa, over four and a half million people. So I thought, this is a country town. I won't be here very long. I'm going to be a you know big city smoke. I'll be heading up there in, in two years' time as soon as I can. Uh, of course, 15 years later, I'm one of the common stories. You come to Canberra, it, it, you fall in love with Canberra, and you stay in Canberra, and it's home for me now. I've gone from working in a business to, to running that business, to selling that business, and then on to Lifeline. So it's been... A, a wonderful 15 years. Australia has been amazing to me. I've met incredible people and absolutely love it here. Love going back to Africa too. So I'm there a couple of times a year. My entire family are still there. Wow. So uh, it's uh, it's interesting. I'm very, very grateful for the technology we have so I can keep in touch with the people that I'm closest to. Yeah, do the Skype calls. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> every day? Every wow. day. I talk to my mum every day. That's amazing. <laughs> Wow. I certainly don't talk to my mom every day, though I did talk to her this morning. Good. (laughs) So tell me about Lifeline. So, Mm. you know, you had a big journey from running your own business. Which business did you, was it? Health health Futures. Health Futures, that's right. And after you sold that, you, or during the same time, you were on the Aspen Medical Advisory Council. Yes, so Aspen Medical purchased my business. Oh, okay. Um, We signed the contract on the day I gave birth to my eldest son good lord so I didn't realize I was in labor um but I was it it was right down to the line um I took a few months off with my little guy and then I went into to Aspen Medical um as their business development manager to help grow that business and settle it in 
uh, when it was well entrenched, it was time for me to, to look at doing something else. And obviously, being a volunteer on the phones at Lifeline, being on the board of directors, being incredibly passionate, I think the only thing distracting me from Lifeline was my paid employment at that time. So when the role of CEO came up, I jumped at it. And mm. I've um, been so blessed to land the role and be in the role for the last two years. What was it about Lifeline that really drew you here? What I came to realise with Health Futures, because we were a corporate health company, we were addressing physical health issues, diabetes prevention, heart disease, coronary risk. We were looking at liver function, flexibility. One thing we looked at and touched on in all of our health appraisals is, and there were 40,000 odd done a year across the globe. Good Lord. We looked at stress, we touched on it. And what I realised having started in the business as a consultant was the fact that unless someone's stress levels are under control and unless someone actually feels um, uh, less stressed or, or not stressed, it's very hard to overcome physical barriers to change. So when you would approach someone to say, have you, have you thought about including brown rice in your meals, for example? Have you thought about joining the gym? Have you thought about, if the individual has a lot going on in their mind, there's very little chance of them being able to make structured, ongoing, sustainable changes to their routine. So I realized that the mind is something that if you got the mind right, the body would follow. Mm. And I studied psychology. My degree is in psychology. I never had the intention of practicing psychology. I've just loved the mind-body connection, how the mind works. I love people. I find them interesting, intriguing. I'm curious. So coming to Lifeline was a natural next step for me because I realized um, at the same time, Going through crises in my own life, watching people I loved go through crises, I wondered what I could do to upskill myself to help. And I started off as a volunteer for that reason, to try and learn the skills. The best organisation to go to for that is Lifeline. Mm. So I started at the top, um, went to, to Lifeline training and, and landed up on the phones. And that was such a privilege to be a part of that process too. Um, but that's how I landed up where I, where I am now. Mm. That's an amazing journey, and I, I, I love how you, the question of how do we actually get people to take action to, to fix their physical self, and this idea that stress gets in the way is, is actually really huge. I've mm. um, spent some time with a friend of mine in Calgary, and she was telling, they, she's a teacher, and they had an initiative, her boss had an initiative, oh, let's have a wellness focus, and she was kind of dissing it a little bit, and I thought, what was behind that? She goes, mm. well... He set up all these programs, you know, we'd have on Friday afternoon at four o'clock go and have a wellness gathering with all the teachers and we'd do healthy recipes. And she goes, he just doesn't get it. You know, four o'clock on a Friday after a huge week, you're absolutely knackered. Mm, she goes, how mm. about you give us less work to do, stop piling stuff on top of us, mm, mm. and then uh, then we might be able to have a crack at doing some wellness activities instead of like, here's yet another project to put on top yeah. of things. Yeah. So stress management and lifestyle management is, is pretty huge. It's a, and it's consistency. So you can, you can often throw in little programs here and there, but unless you genuinely, from a managerial level in a business anyway, unless that's your genuine ethos and that's how you operate and you have a genuine love of people and wanting to leave them better than you find them, those programs are not going to work. Mm. because people need support either side of that to build their own routines and it's 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 difficult it's not easy it's it's um it's distressing to hear those stories because mm. it, it does give those health and well-being programs and those organizations a bit of a stigma to deal with mm. um but on the whole i think um if organizations and individuals are focused on that everything else will flow from that i think i think so too so yeah it, it, i think you have to Individuals and organizations, well, organizations have to get out of tunnel vision of that. We need a wellness program, mm, and, mm. and then just rather than think holistically about all the systems in place in their organization, which actually contribute to mm. to the problem, mm. and to think holistically about how they can shift not only the individual but the structures around mm. them. Mm. So, for those who are not familiar with the work of Lifeline, what does Lifeline actually do in the community? Lifeline are a twenty-four hour a day, seven day a week crisis support service. Mm. The most prominent uh, service we are known for is our suicide intervention, which is the 131114 number that uh, often people are encouraged to, to phone when they hear a distressing story on the news or they, they come across something distressing or they in their own lives are, are feeling uh, distressed. What, what we tend to deal with at Lifeline is a great deal more than that. 
um, we have what we would categorize as three types of callers. We've got uh, mental health, we have crisis, and we have safety. In the mental health space, often if individuals are struggling with anxiety or a diagnosed condition, they're on medications, for example, for a number of reasons they might need to ring Lifeline to receive some assistance in a time when perhaps they're having an anxiety attack or they've taken their medication late and they need some assistance until that medication starts to have an effect, we're there for them. Also, crisis. That's everything and anything that life can throw at you, from financial distress to relationship breakdowns to isolation, addiction. Um, those are the main reasons why people would call in crisis. But of course, uh, we always believe that, that the caller's crisis is their crisis. Um, you might not necessarily feel um, in a day-to-day, -day, you know, for example, we've had callers who might ring up and say, I've got too much money in the bank. And for a variety of very good reasons, that does create a crisis for them. For most people, they'd say, what a wonderful problem. So we, we don't judge. It's, it's, it's your crisis and we're there to support you through it. Um, on the safety end, that's the pointy end of what we do. And that's everything from domestic violence to child safety to suicide intervention. So in the safety space, we do a lot of intervention with emer emergency services. We get many, many calls from individuals in domestic violence situations. Um, that's something that is spoken about a lot more openly in the media. Um, and it's just an, important to us to uh, reach out to individuals and say, look, we are here. Whether you're trying to identify with whether you're in a domestic violence situation or not, some individuals will ring up and say, I'm not sure. They'll talk through it with us. They're not sure. They don't identify the signs. So we're there for everyone in every instance, every day, all day. That's what Lifeline does. Yeah, that's pretty extraordinary, yeah. really. It's incredible. Yeah. And it's all done on the back of volunteers. In Canberra, mm. we've got 730 volunteers across our various programs. Wow. 320 highly skilled, highly trained individuals sitting on the phones. And um, they're there not knowing when they pick up that phone what type of call they're going to get, mm. what the individual is struggling with. They have no idea what their approach will be. But by the time they've heard the first couple of sentences, they know exactly what, what to do and they're there. And it, it's an incredible service. Um, and the individuals here, my team, a very small team here at Lifeline, around 12 full-time equivalent, mm. uh, work with those volunteers to support them through. So there's a very, very extensive, comprehensive supervision process that we use to support to make sure that our volunteers are, are left better than we find them as well. Mm. Mm. Yeah, because uh, you can get vicarious trauma through listening and supporting people through their own trauma. Absolutely. We see it all the time with our first responders, ambulance, police. Uh, PTS is a, is a major issue for so many people because they are confronted with, with trauma in their day-to-day -day roles, trying to do great things for the community and uh, potentially don't have the self-care um, mechanisms or tools in place. They don't have the corporate support, the business or the community support um, to help shake those, those traumas or to help work through them. Mm. Yeah. So speaking of, of business involvement in Lifeline, so mm. it, it's obviously a vital and important service that uh, gets a lot of calls mm. every day and every year in the community. Um, how, how does Lifeline actually survive and exist as, as a business entity? We rely heavily on sponsorship and support. Um, we've also, in the last few years, really focused on our commercial operations, so creating sustainable revenue streams for ourselves. But whilst we do that, we rely very heavily on, on organisations and their support and sponsors. Um, that doesn't need to be financial. So looking at organisations who are considering a social contribution, something I'm looking forward to hearing about more at the, the, the conference, um, there are a number of ways that organisations can help. Individuals, I think, often have a passion for a certain cause and it's focusing on what you can do for that cause. It might not be a financial contribution but rather your time, volunteering to do something for that organisation to lift the burden on potentially their administration or their events. Um, it can be lending your skill set. So we have engagement from a number of incredible um, organisations who might have legal expertise or financial expertise and um, we know they're only a phone call away and always very happy to help. So those are the types of things organisations can always do to help. We can't afford often to pay for a lot of our services because we only get 4% government funding, so we have to fundraise the remainder. Mm. 
Um, why that's important to state is just to, to again reiterate how incredible the support here in Canberra is. What we can give back is our brand. So the Lifeline brand is a very well-known, well-trusted brand. And if we can leverage off that brand for organisations and show them the benefit of engaging with charities because there is a very real return on that investment in so far as there's a lot of goodwill generated, we can create a lot of exposure. Canberrans will support organisations who are supporting Canberrans. Mm. People like to see the money stay in Canberra and the support stay in Canberra. So there's so many reasons why charities and businesses should be working more closely together. Mm. Absolutely. And mm. I think this it's something people are kind of shy about talking about, you know, that, that there is a return on investment in supporting charity mm. when the idea is, don't you just do that out of goodwill? Mm. It's like, yeah, you do it mm. because you care. Yep. And... What's important, actually, is that there's it's a win-win. Um, read this fabulous book I've been talking about on the podcast a couple of times. It's by Adam Grant. It's called Give and Take. Mm-hmm. And uh, have you read that one? No. It's really I will awesome. Now. <laughs> um, he talks about people who give and people who take. And he's he said there's three types of people. There's givers, people who give generously of time, advice, money, resources, etc. There's takers. Those who are very happy to take it and are very self-oriented. And then he said there's matchers, people who give and take in return. So they have a really strong fairness mindset. And his research shows that the people who are most successful um, are givers. And the people who are least successful successful are also givers. It's like, how does that work out? Why are the most successful people givers and the least successful also same type of givers? And he said there's a, there's a key difference between the ones who are successful and the ones who are unsuccessful. unsuccessful. Mm. Trouble with my words today. <laughs> and he said the, ones that, the givers that are successful are, um, have a really strong, compassionate, giving ethos, and that does not negate their own personal ambition. Mm. So they're personally very ambitious for themselves, mm-hmm. and they also are very ambitious for the people they contribute to. So it's not like you have to give and, and be self completely yeah. selfless. The yeah. martyr thing is not uh, in existence for yeah. these people who give at that yeah. level. So when we come to talking about business being contributors, there's absolutely, in my mind, nothing wrong with a business being ambitious for the charity or charities that they support, as well as ambitious for themselves, because, because mm-hmm. it becomes a virtuous cycle. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Being able to be successful in business means a business can support more mm-hmm. of the community. Mm-hmm. And so the community, seeing that, would like to support that business. So yeah. Because it's, yeah. it's a synergistic Yeah, absolutely. Equation. Absolutely. I wholly agree with that. And I think what's being born out of that is the social impact or social investing um, type themes that we're seeing where mm. <coughs> organisations, and, and justifiably, um, we've been labelled, uh, we are a not-for-profit. Um, I don't know how to run a not-for-profit. I don't know what that means because I don't think uh, that just doesn't mean, uh, or what I read into that is that perhaps you all have sustainability issues. I think you have to be uh, for profit. You have to run like a business you have to generate a profit. But I think not-for-profit has has conditioned our industry into that hand-to-mouth existence. And I think some supporters, justifiably, are fatigued with pouring money into what is seemingly a black hole, into administration, into, you know, back-end services, into, um, you know, tea and coffee or whatever it might be for the organisation. They want to see that money that they're donating now produce more money. So teach a man to fish rather than give a man a fish. Yeah. And... I think that's a very sensible way of approaching it. It's a very sustainable way. It's, it's going to be quite painful for organisations like ours to respond to that, to become more sustainable. But that allows us to plan ahead. It allows us to, to look ahead, um, to structure our programs, to alter our programs, to suit the current need. We can respond more readily. There's so many benefits to that. So I think we can learn a lot from business. You know, we are charities, absolutely, but there's no reason why we shouldn't be running like a business. I think that's yep. you point to a really important um, trend or reality, I guess, mm. for uh, not-for-profits, charities, institutions. I worked for not-for-profits for 30 years, so I understand <laughs> what that's like when you kind of got nothing in, in the cupboard to, to try and produce all these great programs. And yep. the reality is, is that charities are business. 
and they've got to operate like one. They, they, they've got similar rules, if not the same rules, in terms mm. of appealing to their stakeholders and providing a service and to make ends mm. meet and to pay staff, etc. Mm. Um, I saw this really amazing TED Talk. I will send you the link, and I'll also put it on the show notes page for folks. Uh, and the show notes page will be at zoerouth.com. Look under freebies for the podcast tab, and then just uh, in the search bar, look for Lifeline, and then the interview will be there. So because we're shifting things around a little bit on the website, I don't have the exact link, but just search for Lifeline, it'll come up. Um, in any case, this TED Talk mm. is by an American dude in um, who's a marketer in the U.S., and he markets specifically for charitable causes. And he has this great TED Talk saying, the way that we've thought about charities is actually hindering their ability to be successful. And he said, mm. um, because when the whole charity notion came out of the pil- this is in the U.S., came out of pilgrims going to, uh, to America and they wanted to have a better life, you know, yep, yep. for religious freedom and also to be financially in a, and successful. However, their religious belief was like, well, it's bad to be prosperous Mm. and so in order to be able to do good in the community set up this whole idea of charity and it's got a long history in England and 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 so on that um if you're going to do good in the community you rely on donations you know Mm. and it kind of perpetuates this idea that money is bad in charities and I've seen this throughout my entire career in those kinds of organizations Mm. where we have this strong poverty mindset and it's really hindering so in the TED talk that the guy talks about uh, he gives a big case study about how he worked for one charity, had a massive marketing campaign because he said charities compete for attention. Mm, mm. Uh, say, you know, they compete against businesses for attention. Mm. And that's what charities need. They need to broadcast what they do, share what they do, so they mm. can invite contributors and sponsors, mm. et cetera, and be successful through whether it's their uh, commercial enterprises or whether it's through donations, et cetera. They need that attention. Mm. Therefore, they need a marketing budget. Mm. And yet, there's this ethos saying, if you look at a charity's accounts, why do you spend so much mm. on marketing? That mm. should have been gone, going to services. Why are you spending so much on salaries? Mm. And he said, that's just backwards, you know? Mm. The best charities need the best workers. And if you deny them paying the staff properly, mm. then they can't do their work properly. And likewise, yep. if you don't give them the chance to be competitive on the world stage or yep. their local stage... Anyway, yep. it's like we need to change our mindsets about <laughs> what do. is a charity. For and it sure. flows over. It's definitely here. In Sydney and Canberra, I had a journalist uh, at this very desk last week saying, you've had two years of profits. What's up? So, so it was a very interesting conversation. Um, but it sparked a, it sparked a very, a very um, meaningful conversation, I guess, around what you've just defined. That's given me a lot more insight into why that's the case. It's, mm. it's definitely the mindset and something that needs to change. And I think businesses want to see the change. And that's where we're sharing information between mm. charities and, and business is is something that is um, all too often uh, ignored or not, or not mm. facilitated. So again, I'm looking forward to, to coming to your unconference because that's an opportunity again to get in front of some business and to learn. Mm, absolutely and yeah to learn from each other and to learn how to do service better really because every business whether not for profit or for Mm. for profit is in the business of serving others Mm. Um, so I got on my high horse about that because I'm so (laughs) frustrated by that you know I see good people leave charities and Mm. and, and, um, organizations who would have stayed had they been more financially rewarded or recognized to have better had better conditions yep. and it's it's kind of like it's trying to do your work with one arm tied behind your back yep. you know it's yep. just frustrating so um okay so off that high horse on <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the businesses that engage with lifeline mm. um you mentioned some some volunteers some give sponsorship etc mm. how do how do businesses in canberra like to engage with lifeline Across across a spectrum. So a couple of the examples I gave there, we've got some organisations who will um, give us a donation and they don't wish to have any uh, recognition for it. They actually wish to remain anonymous. So although they're known to us and greatly appreciated, um, it's not something that the greater community um, shares, that information. So from that end of the spectrum right through to... Um, individuals donating funds in return for uh, promotion through our networks or recognition through our networks at various events. So we we tend to, what I find, 
what I found quite exciting was initially when I arrived, we had um, we had two or three events on a year. We've grown that out to almost eight or nine standing events, uh, major events. Um, and what I've been able to do there is speak to businesses and say, look, what's the best way for you to get your brand out there? Because we create the event. People will come. It's a benefit for us because we were able to engage the community at a time when individuals are having fun. Potentially, let's take the fun run, for example. Mm. Um, I always say to people, find your GP, find your doctor when you're healthy. The last thing you want to do when you're unwell is to be running around town trying to find someone to give you a diagnosis, someone you trust, someone you can rely on, someone you can be open and honest with. Um, we want to be out there creating that relationship with individuals when they are seemingly happy and healthy so that when they walk away, if something does happen, certainly life does happen, we are all vulnerable at some point. Lifeline comes to mind. They know us. They've met us. We're not the scary beast. They know what we're about. They know that we're there for them. Whatever the problem might be, they can pick up the phone. And so it's beneficial for us to get out there. We can fundraise at the same time, always fundraise. And for the organisation um, or the business supporting that or sponsoring that, their brand goes along with that. So individuals, again, can see, well, wow, here's an organisation doing wonderful things. I'm going to go to them first when I'm looking for a vehicle, whether it be uh, or I'm looking for a, um, a service to, to clean my home, or I'm looking for a restaurant, or I'm looking for you know a patron. They'll they'll be they'll be more inclined to use those services because they can see them doing good things. Mm. Um, again, we've got networks that we can we can leverage off and send that information out. So it's very exciting. You can innovate, and and I'm finding that businesses and charities, or certainly Lifeline, are having a very good response from that. So. Then we move on to in-kind time donations. So we've got individuals and organisations that have skill sets but not necessarily funding and they say to us, right, we'll come in for a day and we'll do an impact day. We'll come in and facilitate a strategy session or we'll come in and, um, and assist you with your financial spreadsheets, whatever it might be, and they come in and, and clean that up for us. Um, they use their expertise in, our, in our RT and they'll come in and, and assist us with our new server install, something like that got a very exciting project happening which is uh, top secret over in the phone rooms and there's a couple of organizations who've you know been trying to engage not financially because they don't have the capacity to do that but now they've got a skill set that we need and they can come in and help us with that so that'll all be revealed probably in the next month or so um so any and every engagement we want to work with it's just a case of making it meaningful for both parties mm. um sometimes it is isn't a good fit so sometimes we'll have organisations come in and say, look, we've got 20 lawnmowers we can give you. Um, and and in, in that instance, potentially that's not an example that we've had. Um, we, but sometimes you will have to say, look, how can we work this for you? If it doesn't work for you, uh, can we work it for us? How are we, how are we going to get this uh, through? Sometimes we have to let it go. Mm. So it's not always going to work, mm. but we're determined to try and find a way to work. And I think having these conversations is... Um, what sparks those ideas mm. and just learning yeah that's right yeah mm. I think that's um it's amazing that you're you're thinking so entrepreneurially <laughs> 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 or innovatively about how to engage and support uh, business I think that's um it's a beautiful compassionate way to think about business isn't it it's like how can we help you and how can you help us how can we make a better bigger difference in the community and I think underlying all that is this idea um, that compassion rules in business, you know, um, as opposed to competition. Mm. And it occurs to me that the most successful businesses probably are built on compassion first and have a competitive spirit, but it's, mm. not, it's not a survival spirit. It's not a me versus the, uh, the rest of the world kind of thing. It's, it's mm. competitive in order to uh, grow and contribute. Um, I'd like, I'm curious about your ideas around leadership you've been in a number of different leadership positions from running your own business to being an advisory council to being a chair to now being ceo of lifeline do you have a particular philosophy or uh, motivation in your leadership i i do in life and i think it flows over um and the reason for that is i think we spend half our waking life at work so it's is um, it only half <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no, I'm I'm being uh, generous there. I know it, I know it's more for for most of us. Um, my philosophy and my goal is to leave everyone I meet better than I find them, and 
that doesn't mean it in an enormously measurable way. It can sometimes be imparting a smile or you know, grabbing a coffee or, you know, it doesn't need to be a life changing, but that's the goal I've set myself. And that's what I am adamant about doing at work. Um, I also have a very honest, open communication management style um, that tends to, to place you in, in conversations, tough conversations, awkward conversations, but I'm prepared to have those, I think, uh, for because I value, I value honesty and, and consistency and I value people. Um, so with that underlying goal of making sure that whatever the interaction is, that that, that individual is in some way better than I found them, um, that's how I approach my leadership um, of this organisation and, and previous organisations. Um, I'm still learning. So, uh, again, looking forward always to interacting with people. Uh, I always follow and, and try and engage with inspirational individuals because it is an ongoing learning process. Um, you, you can sometimes overcorrect in any one capacity, in any one a situation and it's about learning from that and moving forward so that's my leadership style I think is um, is that honesty first open communication um, and people you've got to love you have to have a love of people and I think um, I'm very fortunate to have that so I thoroughly enjoy working here I thoroughly enjoy working with any group of people really you've got so many different personalities um, in any one organisation um, and absolutely some are, are tough um, and, and challenging. Um, it's about knowing where, where the boundaries are um, with, with those individuals. But for the most part, people respond to, 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 to people. People all want to be valued. There's a key set of, um, of traits that you can, you can leverage off or start with. And certainly not going to get along with everyone, but you can always agree to disagree. Um, as long as there's a, a productive um, a workplace, and I think every every workplace as well is so different. I've come from high end commercial, where as you say, it's it's about profits, it's about productivity. Um, you can still create an environment that is somewhat a sanctuary based on that that organisation's objectives. Coming into to Lifeline Canberra. Um, a different type of sanctuary creation here so you know you've got to look at your own ecosystem and make sure you've got the right amounts of everything to have it working um, and that's an ongoing process I think we're always learning and the moment you add a new person to the team we've got three new starters this week wow. so excited we've adopted three new family members <laughs> um, we'll look at how they fit in and and um, and how we encompass and embrace them and and how we we facilitate their development onto bigger and better things I try not to hang on to anyone um, if they are better off moving on so you want people to progress you want them to be um, in a better place or where they want to be and that's the first thing about having the right bums and the right seats within your organisation sometimes you have to pay for that as you were saying earlier you've got to invest in good people so yep it's a it's a wonderful role um, to be in when you are in a, a privileged leadership position but um, I'm always learning. That's fantastic. Yeah. And I think you could add humility to your list of attributes, I think, in terms of your leadership um, uh, qualities, I think. So, uh -huh. you know, you were very inspiring yourself. So a couple key things that I took away from you is that uh, people first, compassion, honesty, uh, connection, and to be always learning and growing. And I think that's probably a wonderful way to, to finish off the interview today. I'm so excited that you're coming along as a table host to our event on the 28th yes. of March. Thrilled and to be there. <laughs> yeah, I am. <laughs> well, people are going to be spoiled to spend some time with you as well. So um, I look forward to seeing you there and seeing what comes out of the conference. Um, thanks so much for coming on the podcast today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Good to see you.